All right. So hello, everyone. Thank you for wanting to spend your Friday afternoon with us. Welcome to Any Help's first ever webinar for 2021. So I'm Amelia, the president for Any Help. I will be moderating today's webinar alongside our lecture advisor, Mr. Morali. So Hi, this is a little background for those who are still new to Any Help. So any help with the intention of educating the students and public about the prevention of animal cruelty towards animals. So this campaign witnesses many activities and one of it being webinars such as this. All right, so especially during with health, but not only about mental health, we're going to talk about how it can, how animals can assist in improving our mental health. So joining us today to talk more about this issue, we have the Miss World Malaysia 2000 and 2021, Mr. Shilan Nathan, an entrepreneur and the secretary of the Malaysian National Animal Welfare Foundation and health masters of counseling student and aspiring animal therapist, Ms. Rani. And also we have Ms. Rally, of course. And so now to the speakers, would you like to say a couple of things before we begin? Tanu, would you like to start? Um, I think uh, Amelia introduced us already. Um, hi, okay. everyone. I'm really excited to be back. I think this is my fourth Any Help session via Zoom. It's always exciting to come on board and, and share experiences that I've had over the years as a animal rescuer working with multiple NGOs over the years as well um, with the Malaysian National Animal Welfare Foundation with Shri and um, of course uh, HELP uh, Uni. Uh, thank you for having me back once again Mr. Danish, uh, Mr. Murli. It's always a pleasure. Right. I'll have a little to say. Uh, thank you Tanu for the great intro. You have always done. It's always been exciting partnering with you on a program with HELP and um, I thank uh, Mr. Danish and Murli for coordinating these webinars. I do hope you could have a series of webinars lined up in the year and yeah. uh, and we can most probably share. And it's always been an interesting sharing session with uh, help. So looking forward to the questions and feedback and comments la, as we go on. Ms. Ranita, are you around? Yep, I'm here. Ah, fire away. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. This is my first time doing the forum with any help, but I'm excited to share my results with all of you from my thesis. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be around people who love animals like me. Yeah. Hi, Renita. Nice Hi. to meet you virtually, finally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> likewise. Good, good. So how should we start, Renita? Would you like to uh, kind of start up with the work that you've done? And uh... Sure, sure. So um, I basically did a thesis on the you know, impact that pets had on their owners during COVID-19 because um, as a counselor, I'm very interested in being able to use animals as you know, a form of therapies. So in Malaysia, I noticed that that's not very um, well known because when I was searching online, it was actually quite difficult to see places that were actively doing this. I did find one or two places, but they were quite like outside the city and yeah, it was not very easy to access. So I was interested in knowing, you know, whether pets were able to help their owners basically during this time period. And I found very um, interesting results. So I found that, you know, people had their pets helping them in social ways, emotional ways, physical ways, and um, just generally by giving them a routine. And um, the World Health Organization actually said that, you know, having a routine, especially during COVID, was very important in order to maintain your mental health. So for people who had pets, they actually had to maintain that routine whether they wanted to or not, because you have to wake up, you have to feed your pet, you have to, you know, walk them if it's a dog, you have to play with mm -hmm. them. So yeah, when I spoke to participants, they were saying um, things like, you know, even when they felt demotivated, you know, their dog would come in and then, you know, kind of like force them to get up so they didn't have a choice. And then they'd have to go and take it for a walk. So, you know, it was beneficial in terms of exercise as well. Like some, some dogs are very, very energetic. So you could see that, you know, the participants were forced to be active in that way. Um, and then of course, physical touch, that was something that was really interesting because of course during COVID it was completely limited. Uh, we still are in CMCO, but I guess 
back then you couldn't even like go out and meet your friends. So, you know, being able to hug your pet, touch it, um, that was very helpful for some participants because they felt that they were being accepted by their pets, loved by their pets, because they couldn't go and meet up with family members and friends. So that was also a huge thing that, you know, I found in my in my study. Just being able to touch the pet was able to emotionally regulate people, especially when they were stressed out. Um, one participant was very, very stressed out because she was going through a lot. And she just said, you know, she would pick up her cat, hold it and just cry with it. And she would feel so much better after doing that. And uh, what's interesting is that, and I was happy to find this, yeah, like all my participants saw their pets as family members. So they were no longer just animals to them. They were, you know, loved, valued members of the family and mm -hmm. uh, treated with respect and care. You know, they would be taken for all their appointments. So all of that was um, part of the study as well, noticing that they had that responsibility to look after their pets, even in COVID. So, you know, having a pet can actually help children become more responsible as well. So there are many different benefits. And um, socially, of course, that was the biggest impact that I saw from my study because, you know, COVID had happened. So being able to socialize with their pets, and when I say socialize, I mean they actually would talk to their pets. This was very, very helpful for some of them. People pointed out that, you know, at times it's difficult to tell other people problems that are happening in their lives. But when they were able to share this with a pet, they felt that they weren't being judged. It was often easier to do this with an animal because the animal just sits there, it takes it in and it listens. And um, some of them also said that, you know, pets were able to identify when they were not doing that well and would come up to them and, you know, just be there. So just the presence of the pet, just knowing that your pet was in the room also brought these uh, participants a lot of comfort and it just made them feel very loved. And I think one thing that I found very interesting was um, a single mother who had gone through a terrible divorce and, uh, you know, she described her cat as babysitting kind of and looking after her children for her because it would keep them out of trouble. It would keep them entertained. So it was very patient, very understanding because the, you know, children would take the cat and play with it, obviously. And now because of social media, yeah, they would be taking pictures with the cat and doing TikTok videos. And uh, yeah, you know, the cat was actually just putting up with all of that and it would follow her all around the house. So she felt like she had support from the cat that she never got from her husband. So I think that was also something that was very interesting and something similar reported by a dog was, you know, also um, that the dog was babysitting this child. So, you know, the mom was busy working, but she found out that whenever they brought this Doberman into the room, her daughter would calm down. So they basically just left the child with the Doberman after that because they knew that it was more gentle with her. Um, the dog was, you know, smart enough to realize that this was a child and it couldn't jump around as much. So they're very intelligent creatures and it was protecting her, it was looking after her. So, yeah, these were all things that I was able to find out from my study. Yeah. Very nice. Anyone to share? Anyone like to share? Why everyone is still shy? <laughs> Thanks, Anita. I mean, in fact, your your Anita, input, anything I would like to share? Um, yeah. No, I can. I I mean, I can so relate, uh, uh, Ranita, with um, your studies. I mean, I think all of us who are pet owners, especially, will be able to relate yeah. in the form. Um, I think that's just a superpower, you know, animal superpower uh, to be able to just allow us to connect. I think one of their superpowers mm -hmm. is being voiceless. You know, the fact that they're voiceless, I think. Um, it just makes us, our pets makes us feel like, you know, they need us, you know, and I think as, as human beings, um, that sense of responsibility kicks in, um, that we need to look after them, it gives us a sense of kind of like a hope, you know, something to look forward to every day, especially during isolation in COVID, I think they really helped us cope with the social isolation, loneliness, um, you know, anxiety, you know, and it, all they need to do is just remain quiet, right? Because that's what most people these days forget to just sometimes all you need is a year to listen. You know, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need to say anything at all. Um, and I think, honestly, that's that's just uh, their superpower. You know, and the fact that they are calm and um, they're just there for you. You know, it's just a, a, a being and just another heartbeat that you look forward to holding and, and hugging. So I can I can totally relate to that when you say that. 
Yeah, yeah. I think I'd agree because even for me, um, I think my pets have helped me get through a lot of, you know, stressful times and um, I just like troubling them and being around them. Cause yeah. It's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whenever I used to be really upset when I was a kid um, and I've always had this very innate connection with animals. I would go, and if I was upset with my mom or dad, I would go to my dog's kennel, and I would sit inside the kennel with my dog, like oh. for hours on end. And my parents would freak out; they couldn't, they didn't know where to find me the first few times. And then they realized, oh my god, she's sitting inside the dog kennel with her dog. And I would just sit down and hug it, and just cry and be upset, and just let out all my emotions. And then it really helped, you know. My my pets have been my best friends uh, throughout my my life, and I've always um, had dogs growing up. So for me, uh, it was always a very very strong connection um, with my dogs. Yeah. Do you still do that, Atanuja? No, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, when you do get the chance, I guess when you go back, you'll vent a bit. I like, think we can go to, you know, keep that inner child uh, uh, intact and, and be in touch. It's very, very important for us adults. Well, I mean, on my side, uh, being a father being a vet, so you can imagine, we've been uh, rolling around our pets from the time we were born. Every adopted pet or abandoned pet was in the house. <laughs> and we had to, uh, we had to kind of, we were already given uh, little projects, pet projects to manage them. So my first one was a German Shepherd, and I I, I can never forget her because uh, that's from a little child. Can you imagine yeah. me being a little child at that time? But that little uh, that little German Shepherd was a mixed breed, but it saved us. It saved me once, twice for snake. You know, snakes entered the house. Oh, yeah, wow. and it was a cobra, and the, and the, and the, and the dog has this relationship. You know, even though I was a child, still a baby, according to the maid, the dog took its uh, took the initiative to do what he did. Can, there was a bond, you see. And I think animals kind of, um, I mean, it's an interesting area. We talk about therapy today. It's yeah. a natural form of therapy. Uh, once the bond is created with the animal and us, with the, with the par pet parent, you see a whole level of love and care come in, transcend a natural need and want to take care of. And in, in, re in return, the animal gives you the joy, the little look and that feel, you know, that whole amount of euphoria you have with the animal. You'll forget all your problems for the day. The moment you have pets in, you know, and with all that, they, you know, my little brother became a vet. The whole dynamics of him being the biggest adoption center after that, telling yeah. dad, look, at five years old, you are the vet, right? I brought the cat, do something about it. <laughs> so <laughs> these are the kind of things we ended up with. And then it transcended in looking at family and friends where um, they were, uh, we had, a, you know, we had family members who were disabled and all that and how dad had always encouraged them having a pet around a surrogate friend, and even in our own um, facility, we have a couple of, um, uh, what do you call it, staffs of ours who have been homegrown into managing animals from uh, with Down syndrome uh, and other disabilities, and they work perfectly well with animals. In fact, it helped them um, integrate with society, especially one, uh, Suresh, is an amazing uh, example. He's still working with us for the last 18 years, and even during the COVID pandemic, where his parents had lost jobs, he was the breadwinner of the family. It came down to that level of, uh, uh, it's interesting to see the whole you know, uh, spectrum of it. You know? yeah. But uh, again, um, it's amazing, Ranista, that you're starting to look into this area because animals certainly will be therapeutic. It's all up to us educating the owners on uh, taking the responsibility in managing and being that pet parent, the surrogate parent from yeah. cradle to the grave. And how we can, uh, how that animal just gives you that undying love, love which I find uh, uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, a lot of participants spoke of um, unconditional love, you know, and being able to receive that from their pets. And see, that's the unique thing with animals is because they're not biased. Yeah, yeah. Right. you know, they, they work on instinct and they worked on that whole the behavior side of it. And it, it, if it's unbiased, unlike, unlike us, we think a lot. I think that's the only difference between us and the animal world. We tend to think. For them, it's it's either fear or uh, to, total love, you know. So it's all down to, you know, it, it, it's an interesting thing here that I think during COVID, I guess, with us in the hustle and bustle, running around here and there, now staying at home, we sent to, we this whole season would have recentered us with the animals, if those who had pets at home. And one of the first people I saw who kind of indirectly breached the COVID thing was pet parents who were walking the dogs. They yeah. had to walk the dogs out of the house to do something with the dog around the compound and things like that. I guess 
uh, it's 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 an interesting bond la you know that is help i think someone raised their hand yes there is yeah, anyone but you have a question yeah yeah can you hear me yes 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 we can okay um i was just wondering you know based on your thesis mm -hmm. uh, ranita you know you have got different kinds of pets i i always observe that you know dogs for example you know they are so appreciative when you when you come back after work they are just at the door waiting and they are wagging their tail so happy to see like always uh, a good friend of mine always say you know between my husband and my dog you know there you go uh, the dog is so happy to see me unlike my husband you know see the correlation now to boys and dogs and it lifts my spirit there you know and it's so it's so nice to see him after a hard days work and all i i'm just wondering is it the same in all animals or you find that dogs are different cats are different you know what's well, your I'm a, i i'm a cat one. person so personally <laughs> i my, my cats actually um they're very attached to me so mm. i've noticed that you know if i leave the house and stuff they know when i'm coming back before i've even entered the house there'll be one waiting in front of the door for me so uh, <laughs> yeah because because they know so i think it really depends on your bond with the animal because i've yes. heard so many mixed responses like sometimes it's it's kind of like with people you bond with some people and you know it's just like it, it's not that great but then you bond with other people and it's fantastic you know so i think it's kind of similar in that way like animals if they have a really strong bond with you they will miss you and they'll want to be with you and you know just be happy that you're coming back home i've had the opportunity being quite a bit of uh, different uh, pets over the years mr murli and i would definitely say with a hamster it's not the case so <laughs> <laughs> their wheel and their food rabbits yeah they do get attached i i had a, a rabbit for 10 years and um, he passed on during covid actually last year and and they he looks forward to me coming back he runs to the to the, to the front of his cage and you know he licks you rabbits lick you by the way they like you so I can share with you on that bit about about rabbit fishes no nope, unless they want their food so I think with the dog it's it's um it's a definitely a much more stronger bond I, as well because I think naturally they are social creatures mm. um, they don't alone if you notice if you live in a house if you've got a dog let's say everybody's congregated in the living room and and there's a door in the living room your dog will come and be at that door because their social features they need that interaction you see they'll be where the sound is they want to be around people so i think that is a bond that we share very strongly with them just being social features just like humans are um mm. yeah that, that's what um i can share about having different sort of pets and how they relate how about how about yeah. with reptiles and all uh, can anyone know, give us a little bit of input reptiles no maybe you can ask any participants how about sri lanka sir Yeah. reptiles hmm, interesting i i can tell you abila had a bond with a i don't know what what is the python or something in south africa the huge snake yeah and 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 his classmates had him had him but apparently the snake liked him most so yeah, yeah. kind of hang around i'm sure so, he 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 had a connection with the snake and, and yeah, he had yeah. a good connection with that snake nobody entered the room apparently after that so <laughs> <laughs> and i always wondered whether he's going to get gobbled up but he survived 5 <laughs> years so yeah i i, I guess i that bond when the click kicks in with the with the particular animal um you would you kind of notice you kind of i guess observe the little traits and things like that and then there's an understanding so for example is a snake i guess is an understanding that that's his area or her area and we kind of uh, know that everyone we are around so that sense of security i guess yeah but you should talk factor oh so, you know how some people have a, a stronger relation with uh, certain animals and some people just love their rent sure. reptiles and if sure, one sure. yeah maybe yes yes but i mean on 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 therapy and tarantula i i, I doubt you got to get anything out of it other than the euphoric moment of playing around with a I mean, spider fuzzy and that helps you good lord yeah some people like it some people don't you know yeah, i'm going to freak out when it comes to those kind of spiders it. like it's also the conditioning right the fact that True. we've all been conditioned from young oh <clears> my <throat> god tarantula stay away danger 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 yes, yeah. you know what i mean uh, unlike you know if we, we were brought up like hey that's just a spider or like that's just a cockroach or you know you don't need the, the fear is not instilled i think um who knows you know we all might just have an affinity towards tarantula as pets as well yes yes Yes, Amelia, you have some questions. Yeah, I do actually. I was speaking of your past experiences with animals, right? 
do you think that animals can sense <laughs> emotions? Because oh, you yeah, say totally. you guys, they, yeah, every, uh, it's, it's a natural innate instinct for them. It's a survival, it's a fear or flight uh, survival skill. All animals know it, and you can see the reaction, I, especially when you're rescuing. You can yeah. see the entire behavior change. You know that whole dynamics of it. Yes, totally. And in fact, that's what they work on because they don't talk. Correcto mundo. Because so, yeah, yeah. So um, just to share one one like, rescue experience. I think I shared this in the previous uh, uh, when we had the previous uh, session. Um, when when a time when I rescued a puppy that was stuck near. It was actually in in Kajang and in in this huge. Um, what do you call those electricity? Those like like a power plant. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, um, I sat down with that pup for three hours, sitting down on the floor with food, trying to coax it in a very soft, um, loving voice to come out because it was just stuck in the drain and it refused to come. And every time we approach it, it would dash or it would just just freeze and it and it and it just wouldn't come out. Start just screaming as if someone was hitting it. So what I did was just sit down, spoke to it for about two, three hours. And this is up past midnight, by the way. We're giving little bits of food, you know, earning its trust. Um, yeah, they definitely do feel emotions. They feel fear. They feel happiness. Why do dogs wag their tail? You know, that says it all. But that that sense of fear is definitely there. And eventually, the puppy came out, and I we managed to get it uh, adopted to a really nice home. So yeah, they definitely feel, and I think that's how we relate to them as well. They know when you're down, they know when you're sad, you get probably little extra licks and, you know, more, more, more physical connection. That's what I have with my dog. Uh, yeah. When she knows, she knows when I'm down, my Kaya Bunny, which I adopted, uh, she knows when I'm down and she knows when I'm happy and she knows when I'm sad. And I can tell when she's a little unwell because animals do have also a very high threshold of pain. So I can tell, you know, when, when she's in pain or when she's not in pain, when she's unwell, you know, when she's happy, when she's sad, she wants to play more ball. It's just a, like Shri said, it's just an innate connection that you build um, with them from a young age. Yeah, I think I agree because even uh, with my cats, they are very aware, of, you know, when you're happy, when you're sad, they actually come and they sit around you when you're sad. So I think that they are very intelligent and they know what's going on. Yeah, but they're very conscious, you know, they're very conscious beings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Besides being sentient, I feel like animals um, are just really very, very conscious beings. And the fact, like I said, the fact that they're voiceless may, makes all their other senses more heightened. You know, so like animals can sense when there's a lightning or a storm about to hit like from two, three miles away. This is this is a yeah. fact that you can that right because you know they're all they're on all fours you know so that 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 sensory uh you know connection is very strong they feel that we walk on twos you know the, those little little things um play a, a big part in in how they they can relate to us and and the kind of unconditional love that they give dogs they wait for us all day to come back home what else do they do they do nothing. If you have a pet at home, you have a dog, all it does is wait for you to get back home from the time you've left the house. And I don't think a lot of people even realize this. They just wait for you. That's what they do their whole lives. That's why it's very sad to see when, you know, you leave your dog all day at home and you know that there's no toys or there's there's no there's, there's nothing else besides like maybe another companion for, for that animal to be with, you know, because they're actually not meant to be alone. Just curious, uh, um, let's say if you're talking about uh, uh, assisting, you know, kids with uh, autism, ADHD, or even Down syndrome, how, how would that work if any one of you... Oh, interesting share? topic, my friend. I think uh, Ronita is in the... It's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite an interesting um, area for Ronita to get into a field of interest because uh, I guess there's a huge need, I think, for this particular sector. And at the moment, uh, there are people kind of running little programs. Yeah. <clears throat> on I know one uh, Dr. Q who runs a cat playground. Have you heard of it? It's at yeah. the Putra uh, what do you call it place, which is uh, mm -hmm. next to PWTC a Mall yeah. under Sunway. So, and it's a cat playground, a, right? Yeah, yeah. It's called a cat playground. In okay. fact, his son was autistic, and uh, the whole background behind it is he's a doctor. Son was autistic and found the correlation between the cats and his son. And then, of course, you know, being a mall, uh, it would be better to have a pet uh, cat instead of a dog. So he kind of de designed the entire playground 
to help uh, assess uh, autism in a way. So it's a playground where he as a consultant could also advise and uh, advise other parents if they think their pet, the kids are autistic because he's got a, I think he's got a light room and all the bits and bobs. It's quite, quite interesting. Um, he's taken it to another level. He started it off and I think he's doing a good job. Uh, but again, in all these areas, um, it's good to have more people on board and they can actually yeah. spread these programs into other so parts of the community and making it available. Yeah, you know, it's I mean, very important. Can, I mean, you can use animals to help many different kinds of people, even the elderly, actually, because, yeah. you know, the elderly often don't have as much, you know, social connections, if they, especially if they can't go out. So having a pet is so beneficial. And yeah. uh, when you're talking about things like autism, um, even equine therapy is really, really good. Yes, because, I think know, there's one done by the Malaysian uh, Equine Council. Um, you, yeah. you can Google search for it, including not even um, just autism. It's also other part of, uh, I think, cerebral palsy and other areas where the kids yeah, are actually yeah. disabled. Yeah, uh, and horses I've, have been awesome I've therapy, you know. Know um, someone who this, I can't right? remember the name. They've got a name coined for this, but uh, it's I've an interesting. Thing. A name Therap for what? Awesome. A name, uh, a it's name. a name for the therapy that is offered for uh, yeah. kids that are disabled uh, to so, build up their ability, their contact, and they're able to gait, to walk. Uh, mm. Which is that's an interesting name for this whole therapy where they use horses, yeah, but okay. I, it doesn't come to is mind. But yeah, is it hippotherapy? Hippotherapy, yes, that's the word. Yes, yes. Yeah. I've got to <laughs> remind this correlated to hippopotamus. Yes, yes. Hippo, yeah, but, because uh, the hippo is actually it means a uh, river horse. horse. Yeah. 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 And I hear it's that a, it's, horses are actually much much stronger than the ones they have with dogs. Yeah, because yeah. horses are they are different level the yeah. way they can, and. Go. so that's quite beautiful yeah yes, they're very exactly. intelligent and they bond with um people especially mm -hmm. if it's the same person that they're working with right again and again they are able to build a bond and that's what helps the person improve mm -hmm. yes but uh, it's, it's also the journey to build the bond that's yeah. this yeah. personality thing where they assess you not you yes. assess them yeah. and yeah. then they will they will let you in so it's a kind of a interesting uh, method of them uh, you know building up the relationship you know yeah yeah, oh, yeah. I wanted to share. Yes. Um, during COVID, I have a few friends who. Um, sorry, guys. I just moved in, so they're, they're drilling a bit upstairs. Um, how some of my friends actually fostered pets during the pandemic, and it mm. really helped them get through it. You know, being mm. stuck at home. You know, it helped them deal with their anxiety. They had something to look forward to because you know we we're thrown off our our daily habits, right? Yes. Our, our daily schedules, yeah. and. Um, so a lot of us didn't know how to cope. I mean, you, if you've been living this way for the past 32 years of your life, you've been living this way and suddenly you get thrown off. Um, yeah. I had two girlfriends who were fostering puppies uh, during this time and it really helped them get through their anxiety, their stress, the bond they, they channeled um, with these animals um, really helped them get through it. So I think I was talking to Murali about it and, and saying we should definitely have the session about how um, animals really help during this COVID times, um, especially yeah. when people adopt or fostering. Yeah, I think I think you're right because I was actually working with a client who had really bad anxiety. He was going through a divorce and uh, I was running out of options <laughs> because I didn't know. Like, yeah, I was wondering like, how, how am I going to help him? Because yeah, it, it was just really bad. And then one week he came back and he was like, oh, actually I'm fine now. I picked up some kittens and you know, my anxiety is stopped. And I was like, yeah. Oh. So I tried everything, but you know the thing I want. Yeah, so I, I thought that was pretty. That was pretty awesome. So now you know. Next time, just give them a puppy or a kitten. There you go. Yeah, I, I, I wish that was acceptable. But yeah, I mean now now in counseling, it's it's tough. Like you can't always just bring the animal in because you know like, what if your patients afraid of animals and stuff. So we have to do that kind of assessment. But because it's yeah. not widely done in Malaysia, there's no like guideline on how yeah. to do. This. Because ideally, I would love to have an animal in my, you know, therapeutic setting whenever I counsel clients. I think it makes a huge difference. And well, would Rita, you... I think you may have to kind of build it while you, I mean, build it as you go along. You know what I mean? So yeah. set, I, I guess uh, if you're going to start something new, you might as well, you know, hold and develop the framework as you go along. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, I, I see like sometimes, I mean, this is not intentional, but sometimes because I'm working online with clients, 
um, you know, a cat, one of my cats will wander into the room and it'll do something cute. And my client will go from being, you know, really sad and complaining to, oh, that's so cute. Like immediately they're happy. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, it, it just gives like... Breaks that, the ice, the, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's fantastic. I think like, we have, we have a question there, Anita, um, for those who are... Sorry, As where, to get a pet, is it to improve their mental health in where, what circumstance? I think there's a question from, oh, is it? Um, um, yeah, Amelia, you had a question, right? Somebody wanted to ask a question, Amelia. Amelia. Um, okay. Uh, all right. We have a question from Kai. Kai, uh, yes. For those who, yeah. For those who are hesitant on getting a pet to improve their mental health, in what circumstances should they or should they not be encouraged to do so? I think getting a pet is a huge thing, you know, because it's a lifetime commitment. So if it's yeah. just yeah. if you're yeah. just getting a pet to improve your mental health, um, it's probably better to go to a therapeutic setting. I would say yes, maybe correct. getting a pet is not the right option. <clears throat> you know a pet is like a, it's like a child they never really grow up i mean they do get old and yeah but they're still kind of like children who will always need your care so i think there's so much to consider here do you have the finances to provide for yes, this the family? time the time yeah, the and the care yeah and that that too can you take it yes. to the vet you know um yeah i like like would you be um okay with having allergies because sometimes that can develop over time you know these are all things that you need to consider are there specific animals that are best? Um, this one, I'm not too sure. I need to do more research on this, but I know that uh, you know, dogs, uh, I've, I've heard of guinea pigs being emotional support animals, yeah, cats, yeah. So I think it, it probably is, uh, you know, up to individual preference. Yep. And then uh, just to add on, most research papers are based on dogs, cats, and horses. Mm. At the moment, those are the three classified yeah. animals that are, there's a lot of work done on it globally. You can actually find it and read about Maybe, it. Maybe, uh, yeah. sorry, okay. Maybe Chanuja and, uh, yeah. sorry, okay. sorry, yeah. Chanuja and Trilan. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. This question, are there any specific animals that are suited best for being an emotional support animal? Yes. Yeah, we were, we were just talking animals? about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically there were three, I mean, um, I, I mean, on, I like on, it, on, on, on the research point of view, um, there's a lot of work done on dogs, cats, um, and yeah. horses. I think those have been uh, pretty intense and deep on the work done. Uh, but again, it's it's a bond. Uh, you you It's a selection process between the candidate, the potential pet parent, and the type of animal too plays a part. So again, the um, a person like Ranita will certainly be helpful on the psychology aspect of it prior to looking at animals as a tool because i don't think animals are just a tool they're actually a living being yeah. so they shouldn't be considered yeah. like a device that oh should i have it or not um it's yeah. exploratory uh, but i guess uh, the one of the best ways to test it out is if you have friends who have pets and you have a child who is a little autistic you can kind of bring them around a little bit to see how they kind of react and they they feel yeah. about it you know what i mean uh, don't just simply bring a pet in because you want to test it out i think that's Kind of a bit too far fetched, and then after that, abandon the animal. That's not the way to go. But I yeah. guess simulate the environment where they could come in with an animal and have a go. You know, that'll be one of my yeah. advice. Yeah, that's that's what I we do advise at our center too, anyway. I think that's why we need more centers that are offering animal therapy, so that people can actually make that decision. You know, as to whether they really want to get a pet or not. Because even during COVID, yeah. there were lots of adoptions <laughs> happening. So now yes. we're wondering, will, will, will people continue to keep those animals now, you know, that things are kind of going back to normal? It's very unfair yeah. only, like, for the animal yeah. to be just abandoned yeah, after that. Yeah, to remember yeah Tanuja, you wanted to say something? Sorry, yes, Tanuja. The, the, yeah. It's, yeah. Again, so, um, I think people need to realize that it's at least a 15-year commitment if you get a cat or a dog, you know. And, and it's a sense of responsibility. I think like Vanita said, um, Go for go to a place where you can get that therapy first and see how you bond with an animal of that that sort, and then um, you could consider uh, probably getting a dog or a cat. But remember, it's a huge responsibility because, like, like Renita said, they're always going to be your kids. They're they're just like children. You know, you you need to feed them, you need to clean them, you need to play with them, um, and 
animals have mental health issues as well. They you gotta take into account. <laughs> That's so, so true. Yeah. Especially, whole, especially the ones abandoned and abused. There'll be also things that yeah. it's a two-way, it's a it's a two-way therapy, you know, to get them yeah. rehabilitated too. But, but, but the love they give at the end of the day when they are bonded, the word is bond. When the bond kind of kicks in between the yeah. pet parent and the animal, you would see beautiful results. Um, for example, we have got a doggy school at Banda Otama. We had to put it, close it down during the MCO, and we just started it up. The uh, inundation of uh, people, of students wanting to just get out there and do stuff with their dog, it's just phenomenal. And we have had so many uh, pet parents come in. And the goal is the public school. The whole idea is to drive socialization. Yeah, the need for the owner to understand his responsibility as a pet parent in a public setting, as well as to engage in having his pet socialize with other dogs so that they don't fret. They don't get scared or they don't bark and they don't be a nuisance. Um, and in that entire cycle of it, especially rescued animals is one of my key interests to observe. The amazing change in the animal once he starts with all that stress and anxiety and problems that the animal had um, from its prior life before adoption. And that beautiful uh, synergy at the end, when you can see this dog totally looking like it's been with the owner from child, from a birth, from a, from a pup, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's that, it's that healing that the owner and the pet has in that process, which strengthens the bond. And therefore, uh, the animal has, to me, it, it's, it's a way of lock, uh, getting the owner to kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, build that, build that little relationship with the animal. So this program is actually to help. So those who need help, please visit our school at Banda Otama. You could have us look and ask questions, especially when it comes to dog ownership. We have trainers there who will be able to help you. And um, address those issues before owning a pet. I know there's a lot of responsibility behind it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think one thing uh, that no one's mentioned is also, you know, the possibility of getting bitten or scratched by your pet as well. Like, you know, how many people are okay with that? Because um, some owners, they start declawing their cats because they think oh, that no. you know, Don't so encourage it. Uh, yeah, I'm completely against that because it's literally yeah. like cutting off, you know, your knuckles. So I, I, I think that's terrible. And I feel... Exactly getting pets if, you, if you're not okay with your pet scratching the furniture or, or, or devocalizing a dog i, I totally yeah, don't yeah, agree yeah, with this whole process is, because yeah. technically it's not natural uh, so why have the pet if you're going to devocalize a dog yes I, I just don't understand the whole dynamics of that one but yes i guess feel too right Renita? like you said they feel too they're going to feel fear and sometimes out of fear they're going to bite or they're going to scratch yeah, yeah. So people need to to understand oh. that yeah, so there's, uh, there's a lot to consider when, you know, you're thinking about getting a pet and especially if it's an emotional support pet or something that you're thinking for mental um, health, there's a lot. Maybe even training is required, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, coaching, like more of coaching and proper mm -hmm. person to help facilitate the process, I yes. think is essential. But these days, the, the, the people on board, uh, the few and far between, let's put it that way, but I hope more and more people would endeavor to get into this area of profession and help because uh, I guess there's uh, that's a lot you can do. Yeah. De-vocalizing as a first time I'm hearing that is shocking. Yeah, 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 yeah. you'd be surprised. It's, it's being done. Um, I mean, I mean, sad to say, I mean, I come from a veterinary family. Uh, in the yeah. old days, some vets were doing it as a service. And I think uh, my dad was totally against it and he was... Mm -hmm. He's up in arms when he knows that a pet has been devocalized. Like imagine devocalizing yourself. <laughs> How do you yeah. kind of you know, the stress and anxiety in wanting to express yourself? So just because the dog barked at night, they devocalized the dog. Like, come on, you know, this, this is just way off. And I think that's not that's I think uh, going against all animal welfare. Um, of course, protocol, you, protocols. Yeah, you I think it's unacceptable and unethical. Yeah, you don't want to take away from that animal, you know, you don't want to put your, your pet through something that's stressful. Um, even some people, um, they, they say they adopt a dog who's like six or seven, eight years of age, and they suddenly find, oh my God, he's not been spayed or neutered. Like I just recently had a friend um, who adopted, very kindly adopted a, a very old dog. And she was like, oh, he, he hasn't been neutered or, you know, and I was like, yeah, but he really, you don't want to put an old animal through the stress of going down under anesthesia. And, and why do you need to neuter the, that pet at, at such an, an old age and put the dog through, put the dog's body through that? So these are all little, little things. Uh, I think this is for another topic, Morley. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yes. Sure, sure. Can, can. Murli, there's another question, Murli. I think somebody yes. has. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, you guys have another question. Uh, so Kevin asked, there are some who fall into a depressed state when losing a pet. So is there any advice on how to approach this? Is it a good idea to move them towards getting a new pet to fill the void? Hmm. I so guess um, yeah. I've got, I've got, uh, I think we see it firsthand at the hospital. I mean, losing a pet, it's like losing a child. Yeah. Uh, I think the sense of the whole, uh, I think we need to go through the entire mourning uh, yes. phase yes. and you need to let it kind of go at your own time. Uh, replacing it with another pet immediately doesn't work because no. it's that specific bond, you know, you had with that pet yeah. would be like a person. So I guess um, solutions to it is far and few, few and far between. It's more of dealing with the grief, but mm. but not getting uh, how do you call it? I don't know. Like you got to get out of the anxiety or talk to people. Mm. You got to talk, share, exchange, talk to other pet owners, and maybe grief about it. They help. I don't know. I think Ranita, you would be certainly on the ball in this area. Yeah, Good I mean, I I have lost pets as well, and it's it's a terrible process to go through. Yes, so, but it, know, it's a process we have to go through anyway, you know. Yeah, yeah anyway. we, you have to go through it, but I think you never forget, you know, you always remember these pets that you're very connected to. So I think forcing yourself to move forward by bringing something else into the picture may not always be the best option. I'd say maybe grieve, give yourself that time to grieve I, yes. first before, you know, making such a big decision. Exactly. Yeah. Until you're ready and if you're ready for it. And you've met the little puppy that suddenly looks at you and wags his tail and you want to carry him up and he's going to start a new journey in your life, then go for it. I yeah, for me, it. for me, I think um, my first real, I wouldn't say, because, you know, of course, uh, when I was very conscious of having a dog of my own, I think it was when I was about 10, you know, I've always had an innate connection with my parents' pets that they've had growing up, right? But I think my real first dog was... Um, my dog that I adopted, her name's called Nala, and she was with me for 17 years, from the time I was 10 years of age, right up till I was 27. So she went through literally primary school, high school, college, uni, you know, graduation, the whole thing. And when she passed away, wow, that was uh, that was really, really tough for me. Um, it took me a long while, uh, but I think it's very impo important that you sit with your yourself, sit with those emotions and and you know, like Murali and sorry, like uh, Shri and Ranita said, you have to go through the motions and um, you come out on the other side. And then I thought that I could never have another dog again. And then I was suddenly ready. And then I adopted another girl, uh, Sheba, and she was with me for 13 years. And then when she left again, it was that whole process. And after her, I really thought like, oh, my God, I've got no more capacity in my heart to have any more pets. And I actually didn't want any more because I was traveling so much. And then my mom's like, yeah, this is the last dog that we'll have. We're not going to have another one anymore. And then boom, two weeks later, while she's lying down, she's like, can you start looking for me for one with a black face? Because all our dogs had bright. She's like, I want another one, another dog. And that's how Kaya came along. So, you know, you, you got to sit with it, sit with the motions and grieve. And you, you will know whether you want to have another one or not. I think that's something that you will be able to to gauge and um, identify with yourself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Murli, we've got a question. Yes. Uh, Amelia? Uh, one more question mm -hmm. from Joseph. For emotional support animals, are you able to just get any animal to be it or do they have to be specially trained to be an emotional support animal? Hmm, interesting enough. Uh, in the States, um, there are already programs to have uh, or select uh, puppies, dogs, or cats, you know, at a certain yeah. stage for emotional support. In fact, they've gone all the way down to uh, Medicare, uh, even dogs that can actually work with a person with a heart murmur, mm -hmm. and they are monitoring the whole process, you know. Now they're using pets to do it, especially for old folks. They're always on their own. They may be living in an old folks' home, and therefore dogs are allowed, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, they are, that's the whole spectrum of it. But over here in Malaysia, uh, it's still a long way to go. I guess um, it's a, the emotional support comes from just looking at companionship and the bond. I think that's the level that we are at the moment compared to what they have overseas where there's a lot of assessments and a lot of people to meet. Uh, one, of course, somebody like Radita will be uh, useful in having the discussion on the whole process. And then they'll have uh, a behaviorist come on board with the animals or you'll visit a center to be able to tie up to see whether the particular animal would fit the home 
and then th sometimes it's technically with a um, with a coach or a mentor. It's a whole program, you know, that you sign up to and and go through. Uh, and here and here in Asia, we're still pretty young at this whole process. And I guess if the various skill sets are available, uh, I think we can do it. I mean, in this time and age where everything is online, um, uh, it's just getting the right people on board to help and facilitate the whole thing. The program where they they identify puppies that are a little bit more calmer, they would suit the yeah. most. Therapy thingy, right, Shri, that, that, Yes, that. yes, the whole assessment. Uh, that's part of the, one of our objectives in the foundation mm -hmm. was to establish a group of people who can actually take it further. My, my brother did uh, his particular thesis when he did his um, his uh, specialty course in ophthalmology, since he's a veterinary ophthalmologist, was the assessment, uh, a calculated assessment on the ocular uh, view of dogs and to assess which dogs could be used for the blind. That was his mm -hmm. working paper. And he's yet to want to drive that whole program here because for the blind, they said the dog is an amazing bond. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, the blind, even when I was in the UK, with their dogs and amazing work the dogs do, you know, getting them from point to point, knowing exactly what to do, pick up the stuff, pick up a bowl, just helping the blind person be active. Um, it's a huge uh, removal of distress for the particular person uh, because the dog is a total companion line, you know. Um, and even understands the owner without talking. So it's, uh, it's a fair bit of work. So it's it's a need to put this together. And I guess we can do a lot more. So at the moment, we're just looking for people who have certain skill sets to help us out and maybe possibly roll out programs in, in the future. Yeah. But Sorry it's, it's been, it's been on the plan for some time. Sorry? What? Sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. I think uh, Tanuja has to leave, I believe. Yes, oh. I do. She so sorry. <laughs> It's been an absolute pleasure talking to all of you. I hope um, all the students who've joined, you will uh, gain something from this. I'm sure you will, uh, whether innately or you know consciously. Just um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a beautiful to have a pet, own a pet, uh, but it's also a sense of responsibility, and that's what I would just like to leave with. Thank you so much, uh, Ranita. Thanks, Tanuja, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Tanuja. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, yes. Talking with have a good you guys. day. Take care. Take care. I know we're all very passionate about this and I'm looking forward to having more sessions with y'all more frequently. <laughs> exactly, Burli, more frequently. Ouch. <laughs> okay. The stress point is put on you now. Big boss has raised his head at the same time. So if Danish has put his hands up, I think... No, I, I was just waving to Tanuja. <laughs> oh, you're just waving? Oh, sorry. I uh, misconstrued it as uh, a, a strong approval, uh, approval to the whole process. Good try, Milan. <laughs> Okay, guys, anyway, I, I saw a question here, Miss Miss Yo. Yeah, is it Yo? Is it? Yes, yes. Uh, about the cost. I mean, honestly, yeah. uh, having a pet. Uh, let's put it this way: a few things you got to look at the five freedoms. Yeah, one, you got to have have a place for the animal at home. It's no point having a dog when you don't have a, a place for him. Is he going to be indoor? Is he going to be outdoor? You got to think about that. Then number two, uh, money. Yes, it's subject to us. As with us, you need to get your groceries and things right. So you got to look at food. And the basic necessities, right? Third, you should uh, you you kind of normally have to visit a vet. So when you have a pet, the vet is your point of contact. There will be some medical bills uh, based on vaccination, spaying and neutering, and things like that. But if you do need help, do call us. We can always advise you what to do. Um, but in the picture of it, is it's like having a child forever, and the child does grow. So uh, we have different life stages. Huh? A puppy or kitten is up to about a year. An adult stage is between one to six to seven. After seven, they're considered senior pets. So um, as, a, as a pet parent, you'll have to read a lot, understand, and also uh, understand life stage especially, and manage the life stage accordingly. And um, I guess if you do all that, then the cost of managing of a pet is not too high. Only, of course, in the end stage, if there's any surgeries or any medical problems, as with us, you know, technically we have to go for checkups anyway. And they do pick up problems. There will be some cost to it, you know. But in the whole overall big picture of it, read about the animal. Talk to a friend who has a pet that you're looking for. For example, if you like to own a dog, talk to somebody who owns a dog. Have bonding sessions. I mean, now with the MCO being a little, you know, you can still meet up and catch up and get a feel of it before you do so. Does that help? Okay, yeah, he says yeah. yes. It does. Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs>
No worries. Contact us if you need any uh, any other help. I'm sure Mr. Murali will be able to share our number, and we can always help you out. Yes. Maybe we have. We can right. just have one more question, Amelia. One more. If you want to ask one more last question. Okay. Um. Actually, I have a question for Miss Ranita. Actually, uh, sure. one last okay. question. So. What can you explain further about the field of animal therapy? Like what, what, like what do we, what do you do, and all that? Yeah. What I do? Well, I mean, um, I guess animal therapy it can be used in many different ways. So sometimes it's just um, animal education. You know, taking an animal and uh, showing it to people and educating them on it. So that would fall under animal education. Then you've got animal assisted activities. So that's where you know you have an animal doing things like, for example, taking a jog in the park with the, with the dog. So that's like an activity. And then you have the more um, focused version of that, which is um, animal therapy. Yeah, so that's, that's where you're using an anim animal as part of the <coughs> therapeutic process to achieve very specific goals. You know, like maybe socialization skills. Um, it could even be, you know, to improve fitness. So I think those are the differences, really. And it depends on whether the person actually needs an animal as well. So you don't just use an animal for no reason. It's actually, um, you know, based on what the client would require. Yeah. And here's a question, Ranita. Was there a program locally that you signed up to? Or was it overseas that you took up this course of yeah. study, field of study? Oh, I haven't, I haven't done it yet, but this is what I want to do. Okay, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Because in Malaysia, sadly, it's not, it's not available. I tried searching everywhere, like where so can I... So I was quite curious, where, you know, where Yeah, you... okay. yeah I, I just read a lot. So everything I know, I read. But I think in the US would probably be the best place, you know, to go and get this kind of training because they're, they're more open to it. And yeah, it's, it's kind of growing there a lot. In, in fact, uh, give me a buzz after this. I may want to connect you to a couple of people I know. So okay. maybe we could, you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Help you expand on that area. All right. I, I have a question. Yes, yes. No, Sriland, this yes. question is actually directed to you. I mean, oh, you've been in me. this uh, business for many years. Good Lord, the business. Yes, I'm yes. just looking. I'm just looking at the awareness about, you know, dealing with their yeah, animals, you know. Do you see a, a marked improvement over the years that people are more aware of how to deal with their animals the way it should they should? Or do you feel that there's still a lot of ignorance and that right. they really uh, don't know? I guess your question is very interesting, Danish. Um, and I think I need to break it into two little bit parts. First, first area, awareness. Very Actually, it's a lot higher today with social media and the mobile phone is one way to connect. La. So the awareness on animal care or the interest to own a pet and all that within the younger generation has just exploded over the years. You could see by the number of rescuers volunteering to go out and save animals, the number of shelters that are opening up to try to rehabilitate the animals. So the awareness and the heightened awareness is there. Two, you can actually see the Animal Welfare Act in Malaysia that has just been launched in 2017 is one of the most comprehensive acts in the world. It's even outdoing the Australian Act in a few areas. Um, and that's already a sign that actually Malaysia is evolving. The whole respect for animals is there. But on the other side, on the, um, how do I put it, on the maturity of knowledge about care, uh, it's still a long way to go. Uh, everyone kind of uh, reads about it somewhere and guesses. I guess one of the points of knowledge would be coming from the veterinarian in the community. There's still a lot more education that is required to be put out there, uh, things to do, not to do. The issues we have today is not about um, managing a pet. It's today the urbanization environment for a pet. Um, we have a lot more um, owners, how to do it, over pampering the pet, turning the pet to a full child, pets going into KFC, McDonald's, whatever. And then you see this medical, whole host of medical problems associated to it. So I guess this is the level of education that needs to be out there, that even though you have a dog at home, yes, he's, he's your boy, uh, you also still need to monitor the nutritional requirements, you know, monitor the health, monitor all those kind of things, and take it a little seriously there, because sometimes due to over-pampering, I know it's love and care, uh, it may put the pet through a fair bit of stress. So trying to answer your question, yes, 
heightened awareness, but as in education and knowledge out there, uh, we still have a fair bit to learn. But in general, the Malaysian public, from what we see as a practice, uh, do love an animal. Even, even if they've rescued an animal, they just walk in. We need some help. And so the level of heightened uh, awareness is there. No doubt, I think in social media, you also seen the awareness when somebody abuses an animal, the way it goes viral. So that that's a kind of a, a feel to the level of animal care and welfare in this country. Mm -hmm. And I guess it, it's it's uh, encouraging uh, that the younger generation is totally immersing themselves into this. It's it's more like a cause to help. And it's nice to see that uh, I hope uh, more and more um, I, I hope the local council requirements and the laws will also in time to come be re reviewed and changed to be able to allow for pets in condos and apartments and uh, formal dwellings, you know, and also for the ability for the disabled to bring their dogs or animals into public spaces. Those are kind of infrastructures on the high level that needs to be addressed in time to come. I guess it'll help spur the dynamics of this uh, in the right context. Okay. That leads me to the next question. Yes. Um, what do you reckon would be the advice for universities like HELP, you know, to actually create more publicity or awareness in this area? You know, what do you think we can do to ensure that, you know, more people are aware of what needs to be done to make sure that animals are treated well? Uh, animals, if they decide to adopt, know what needs to be done. What are the things that we can do? You know, we've had any help for the past 11 years. Yes, so, yes. And, yes. you know, it has been very, very good in the sense that we are creating. But what can we do more? I think this uh, this level of exchange, uh, the more videos you're, you're sharing and talking about it and raising awareness and, and the sharing, like, there's more sharing sessions, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think uh, people learn when they exchange and ask questions and 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 uh, you know, take off those myths that they had in, in doing what they do, uh, with all the experts that we have on board. I mean, we've we've got Ranita here on the area of psychology and behavior. You know, my brother possibly on medicine. And so I guess the more we exchange and share, uh, I guess the more awareness gets rolled out. So we, I think that's one area that you guys are already leading in this area. I think Taylor's also are interested to do it. A couple of universities are also starting to call up and ask for help. I said no problem. But uh, it came from your project, actually, uh, Danish. <laughs> so congrats. Well done. Credit goes to Murali. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, of course. The man who coordinates the whole thing. Mm. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Srila. No problem. I mean, let's let's talk about doing something more in the future, especially maybe even like a conference or something like that. You yeah, know, going virtual, maybe having people. the universities. Yeah, use the virtual uh, technologies today to bridge people together, to talk to all these people who maybe even own pets. Like, you know, we have Anthony who who lives with his uh, melanor, who basically depends on his melanor his entire life. He lives mm -hmm. on his own. He's, yeah. he's paraplegic. He's on a wheelchair. But his yeah, dog, yeah. his dog is his partner. Yeah, and, he's a uh, friend of any help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, the sharing this help. Any help and, uh, many years ago. Exactly. Maybe we could, we could, we could have him on board, on board on a particular topic on pets and the disabled and, you know, get mm -hmm. people then who want to come on board and share and exchange. I guess the more we do this, uh, it's better than just printing posters and brochures. Today, I think it's more virtual. It, it goes a long way. Yep. Good, good. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Morali. All right, so I think we have come to the end of the session. We passed five minutes, so it's all right. Um, on behalf of the AnyHelp team, I would like to thank the speakers, Mr. Shilan and Ms. Renita for coming here, and also Ms. Tanuja, but she's not here anymore. And also thank you to Mr. Danish for being here, and to every single one of you who attended this webinar this afternoon. So that is it for today. Thank you, and have a great and pleasant day ahead, everyone. Bye-bye.